Welcome to our first lecture on ancient Greece. So we'll be looking at Greek culture um, and art making in really three main categories. Sculpture, obviously, architecture, but when it comes to painting, unfortunately we don't have an enormous number of uh, fresco paintings, wall paintings, to be able to look at as we have seen in some other cultures. Most of what we know about Greek painting we derive from studying painting on vases. So most of the Greek painting examples we'll be looking at will be imagery made on ceramic vessels. You don't have to memorize all of the timelines necessarily, but definitely worth thinking about classical art in ancient Greece, kind of breaking down into really three major phases. The geometric, very early period leading into the archaic, you could think of as the early phase. The classical era uh, brings us to the time of Alexander the Great, and then the Hellenistic era follows after Alexander the Great and leads us into the period um, prior to Greece being absorbed, um, or rather into the period of Greece being absorbed uh, by the Roman Empire. So as always, BCE is before the Common Era, Common Era starting at the year zero, and so we are now living in 2020 uh, CE, or Common Era year 2020. We've already looked at a couple of examples of vases in our study of art of the Aegean. So moving into the culture of ancient Greece, we see a really uh, evolved system of types or silhouettes, size and shape rules for what different vases should be. Um, they have different uses and different names. So the ones that I've outlined there for you in red are the ones that we'll see the most frequently. Amphora we've already seen, and amphora is usually a storage jar. We have seen a handful of jars that are used for pouring things or for storing things. So amphora tend to be for storage. The crater is the one that's most frequently used as the widest mouth vessel for mixing water and wine. The wine that the ancient Greeks uh, created was much, much stronger than the wine that we're accustomed to, and so it had to be diluted with water uh, in order to be drinkable. And so that's what the crater generally is for. And you can see three different types of crater designs um, outlined for you there. Just generally, you can tell them apart. The amphora tends to have a narrower mouth, and the crater has a much wider mouth. The uh, Lekthos that you see are uh, vase types that are used for the storage and also for pouring, obviously, of either wines, but more frequently oils and often perfumed oils. You'll also see a handful of vases of this at the bottom. The Kylix is a drinking vessel, believe it or not. You would use your thumbs through those loops on the sides there and then you would tip this shallow bowl-like structure toward yourself to drink. So the ones we'll see the most frequently, though, again, will be the amphoras, the craters, and the lexos. The meander pattern is something you'll find on a lot, especially of the early Greek examples we'll look at. We sometimes call it the Greek key, and you can see it right here in this band of decoration that's included on this slide. It's this pattern of right angled lines moving in and out around each other. They sort of look like old-fashioned keys, hence the Greek key. Interlocking metric designs, and you can definitely see that here in our first piece to know for the test. This is the uh, geometric period, geometric crater, which comes to us from the Dipolon Cemetery. And believe it or not, this crater was actually, although you could use this form for mixing wine and water, this form actually has perforations at the bottom that would have allowed any liquid that fell to it or was poured into it to go straight into the ground, to be absorbed into the ground below. And that's appropriate because this is, in fact, a grave marker. So it's entirely possible that the um, family members mourning this person when they came to the grave would pour libations into it so that that could be enjoyed by their deceased loved one in the afterlife. So if anybody wants to make one for me, go right ahead. I'd 
quite enjoy that. This is an image, though, that I think combines some of what we've seen in the styles of the ancient Aegean, even a bit, I suppose, of, of some of the concepts that come to us from ancient Egypt into a new form. This geometric style, this all-over pattern and texture of lines and marks, there's triangles, rectangles, diamond shapes, um, all sorts of geometric uh, objects or shapes throughout the entire texture of this piece. But you notice where the handles are, where the swell of the vessel is at its greatest is really now a focal point for decoration and this particular decoration gives us a depiction of a funeral and you can see the dead body lying in state and he's on this horizontal surface right here so again the more horizontality implies either rest case death and the more verticality implies life or, or activity the mourners on either side actually seem to be tearing their hair out and dripping tears that's what this intense pattern is beside them the wife and children of the deceased are depicted as well so we kind of assume that the more uh influential you are in society, the more mourners there would be at your funeral service. It's also, of course, entirely likely that you could easily pay a vase painter to add a couple extra mourners than you could to pay for professional mourners to attend. And in fact, that was one of the few um, jobs that women could hold in ancient Greece uh, was as mourners at graveside. We know that we tend to think of Greek culture as being a little bit male-centric. Um, women were not allowed to vote. Women generally uh, were restricted to the home. We also think of the Greeks as having a uh, very stoic and emotionless demeanor. And so really, funerals would be about the only time that uh, extreme emotion would be considered even remotely acceptable. You can see, though, that the geometric style really gets its name from the fact that everything is made of geometric shapes. Look at the torsos in the bodies. They are inverted angles with the apex of the triangle forming the waist. And we've seen very narrow-waisted figures throughout the Mycenaean uh, and Minoan artwork that we looked at earlier. We're seeing that again here. You can see some curvaceous lines in the legs, especially uh, the upper uh, thigh, and that tends to uh, remind us a bit of the imagery that we saw in the Cycladic plank idols. So very obviously, the artwork of the Aegean is being synthesized and combined into this new form. You notice that all of the decoration is in dark black against a yellow, yellowish reddish tone of the clay. And that is going to be a hallmark of Greek uh, vase painting for quite a while. So the Examples of these funeral vases, you can see again the Dipylon vase to the left very much like the De Crater is absolutely covered in geometric pattern, which is really beautiful to look at. But a funeral scene very much like the one we just saw uh, occupies that horizontal band nearest the largest swell of the vase. It would give you more surface area to work with, and it also is a focal area as well. So that um, detail that you're looking at in some ways at a distance you just see the patterning but when you get close to it you start to be able to pick out the individual figures looking again closely at the surface of the funeral scene you can really see that there are no sophisticated naturalistic depictions happening it's almost as if the bodies are made up of these symbolic geometric shapes i particularly like that the heads are just simple circles with dots in them for the eyes again the greeks are going to start using some things that are seen in other cultures these registers and the idea of the ground line at the bottom of each of those registers is pretty typical. And you see that primarily the work that we're looking at from ancient Greece, as it begins to become more um, sophisticated in its, in its detail, still has this reliance on a very black silhouette against a lighter ground. And that's very typical 
of what we refer to essentially as black figure painting. You can see that here in the blinding of Polyphemus. Polyphemus is the Cyclops, and our heroes are trying to escape from being uh, captured by him, and so they are able to succeed in that. Once they have blinded him, they are able to escape. And so what you see here are, again, torsos that are fully frontal, but legs and hips and faces that are in profile, that composite view is very prevalent, but notice that the bodies are still sort of triangles coming to narrow waist, but we're starting to see more articulation in the bodies more and more and more as we go. With this particular example, which is really pretty small, I thought you guys could really detect from this one in particular that the way that the details are done with these black uh, silhouettes is by scratching the lines of detail into those black silhouettes. And so that's how the black figure technique gets its name. The way that these images are painted is really pretty remarkable. The vase itself is made in red clay, and then a refined clay is used to paint the silhouettes of the bodies and animals and whatever else is gonna be on the vase. But as it's painted on, it is very slightly detectable different color red from the red of the vase. It does not look black when it is painted on. The lines are scratched with a needle, scratched into those black silhouettes before the clay is exposed to heat. And so the clay is put, uh, the clay vessel, once the decoration is completed, is put into a kiln and that is allowed to um, vent oxygen and have vents open that allows the clay to become very hot but allows oxygen around the vase in its first firing and then the vents are closed and it's in that closing of the vents that that uh, vessel begins to turn black after that second phase of the firing when the vents opened again the part that's been painted that fine refined clay remains black, where the coarser area of clay, the background, if you will, the negative space, reverts back to its red color. So this technique of creating these figures in black was obviously a very time-consuming technique to do, and we call it black figure because the images are all in black silhouettes on a lighter red ground. We also know that a lot of the vases were signed. They include often text that identifies who the characters are, if there's a narrative story happening, especially if it's a mythological story. But we also know that there are um, inscriptions on them that indicate for you who the potter was and who the painter was. So people were beginning to be known as artists of high school during an early period of Greek history. This definitely gives you a sense of some of the beauty of black figure painting, but then also a bit of its limitations. It's a little bit harder to see the detail in these unless you get really close to them. Those incised lines are a little harder to read, but a black outline against a lighter tone is a little easier to read. I love these inscriptions, though, that, that literally say, as if the vase is speaking to you, Asus made me. It's the name of the artist, but it's as if the vase itself is speaking. It's a really great um, way of thinking of art as being a living thing. Exekius is perhaps one of the best known of the black figure painters. We'll see several examples here of Exekius' work, but the one to know for the test is his vase that includes the image of <clears throat> Achilles and X. Achilles is the figure with the helmet, and this is a scene from, actually, the Trojan War, um, which the Greeks will win, but, of course, Achilles eventually uh, dies when he is struck in his one vulnerable spot, his heel. His mother, of course, famously held him in the water of the River Styx, which is the river you have to cross to get to the land of the dead, um, and that gave him this invulnerability, except for the area that wasn't dipped, which was the heel that was covered by her hands. Refer to the Achilles heel as somebody's weak point.
point or vulnerability. And you can see here that unfortunately, although he dies in battle and Ajax then um, is his successor, you can kind of see a little bit of tension between the two as they play this dice game. You can really clearly see there that they are speaking one another. And Achilles has the higher uh, number. He's uh, rolled more successfully. You can really clearly see this incredibly intricate pattern in their garments. It would have taken an enormous amount of skill. Just try to imagine the color of the clay being red and the color that is now black being red as well. And trying to distinguish where you are incising those lines would be a really remarkable accomplishment. Also start to see here a little more naturalism in the body. If you notice, these figures do not have their torsos turned toward us. They're fully in profile, although the eyes are facing forward. The torso and the legs, everything in this pose is in profile view. I thought you'd like to see this as well as a transitional piece. There are actually several examples. This happens again to be Achilles and Ajax playing dice, but this piece shows you the transition from black figure, red figure, and we're seeing the front and back of the same vase. So on the left-hand slide, uh, side of the slide, you see the black figure version of the story. And on the right, you see the transition to what we call red figure. And in this advancement in vase painting, they simply reversed which section of the image would be black. Instead of doing a black silhouette with incised light lines, they realized it was much easier to read these uh, linear details if they were dark lines on a light ground. So the negative space became black and the positive area, the figure itself, became the red of the clay, which allowed the artist to paint on those linear details in a way that would read more easily to our eyes. It's really kind of remarkable to think that the very same technology, but just a switch in the figure and ground, changing the background from light to dark, really allowed much more ability in the figures, especially in the details. You can see that again here. I really love these vases that are sort of straddling the line between both styles. So red figure versus black figure. I really think you can see the details more clearly. If you think about drawing with a pencil on a piece of paper, you start with a light ground and put dark marks on it. It's a little easier to read than trying to put white marks onto a dark ground. So you can see the difference here. So the second big phase of the decoration is the red figure, and it allows us to see uh, more movement, more fluidity, and more detail quite easily. Also, it's uh, notable to think that the way that these are painted, those very finest lines, are done with a tool similar to a syringe. So you can think of them as being able to control a really, really fine line of this liquid slip, painted still red, but then in firing, that slip becomes eventually black. This clearly gives us the type of image we're accustomed to. I think with ancient Greece, we can see much more attention to the detail in the body and those contours in the muscles are so much easier to read in this technique of black line on a red body. Check out the foreshortening from knee to the ankle and the way the foot actually comes toward us in this figure of Sarpedon is just outstanding. The realism that's happening here on, on a curved surface, on a limited color palette, just makes you wonder what they likely were able to do in terms of painted mural decorations. It's really quite astonishing level of accomplishment here. Euphronius work here, Heracles wrestling and Pios, definitely an image that gives you a sense of intense movement. But you don't really feel that the Greek figures, the hero in this case, is the, hero, the character that feels more uh, focused and less emotionalized. If you look at Heracles, his face is kind of stoic, expressionless versus this anguished uh, view on the Libyan giant that he is fighting. So you get a sense that once again, we can show more 
emotion in the enemy than we can in an image of a Greek character. Euthymides' Three Revelers is an amphora to know for the test, specifically for the purposes of recognizing it as red figure example versus black, but also to notice the way that the figures are presented for us. We have a real sense of three-dimensionality in the body, especially in the reveler in the center. The fact that we're seeing him from behind, but with the torso turning and acknowledging that movement in the center of the body around the hips to be able to put the torso into this back view so we can see the back of his neck here and his face in profile really creates a believable three-dimensionality that we have seen in much two-dimensional work up until this point. I really thought this would intrigue you as well. This is an interesting red figure vase that includes examples of people making art on vases. And you can see that pretty clearly here, right? But there are artists at work on this end of the image, and they're very, very rarely seen. It's kind of odd to think that this example exists from Avery's and that we wouldn't see it in more textbooks on art history, but check her out. You look at the side and there's a handle right here. So she really is on the edge of the scene. Even in the case that she's in, in the museum, this figure's a little bit hard to see, but there is quite obviously a female artisan working at creating and decorating these vases. So we know that it may have been rare for women to have um, public jobs. We know that it did happen on occasion. Another rather rare depiction of a female figure in the nude. It's much more likely to, that we would see a male figure in this position. So we've talked about black figure and red figure. I think you guys have those pretty locked down. White ground painting is the next one to be aware of. And in this technique, the pot is covered in a slip that burns white. And we've got the addition of color on a white field. So it is the closest thing to what a mural might have looked like on a wall. So about as close as I can get for you to thinking about what Greek painting might have been. We also want to take a look then at sculpture and at architecture. And so there are examples outside of temples of uh, statuary that depict fierce animals. And very early on, you see that the figures have a kind of stiffness and a similarity to the paintings that we just saw from the geometric era, these triangular torsos, but with kind of emphasized round buttocks, thighs, and calf muscles, somewhat similar to the Cycladic plank idols that we saw um, in the Cycladic islands as well. So we definitely have female figures who tend to be um, less active than male figures. This pillar statue uh, in this shot here that you see is the way she looks now in the museum, but the shot beside it is a recreation painting to try to show what the figures would have looked like. Um, the Greeks absolutely painted their work for sure. This happens to be a Greek colony in Egypt, and so you can kind of see a feud between Egyptian style and Greek style. You can see that there is some suggestion of the female body, of course, in the breast area for sure, but notice that it also feels somewhat Egyptian in that it is very solid. It doesn't seem to move forward. The figure is very much a vertical block of stone. Some vocab terms we need that are hugely important for us, the kouros, kore, archaic smile, and peplos are terms definitely to know. Um, a male kouros, plural is korai, is a statue of a young male, usually um, almost exclusively nude, almost always youthful, almost always athletic. The core, it's sing singular, or kore, plural, is the female equivalent to the Kouros figure. This is the female statue from the same era, the archaic early era, 
they are always are almost always fully clothed the clothing tends to be very heavy and it tends to kind of obscure or flatten the figure and de-emphasize the curvature of the hips you could argue that to some extent what's happening here is the greeks are showing a preference for the male body not so much as a sexual fetish but as a sample of activity and what they considered the ideal of human um, existence to be. Men were active and men were powerful. And so even if this were a statue of someone who died in middle age, the funeral statue would be youthful and strong. The Greeks were all about idealism. They were about this search for perfection. And one of those concepts becomes a sexist concept. It really is that women are more emotional and less um, able to control. Men are more powerful, more logical, and all of this, of course, is the point of view of the Greek culture of the ancient world. It doesn't really jive with how we uh, perceive human beings' abilities in today's culture, but you can almost see a, an expression of female equality happening in the statuary. Weirdly, the less clothing that is shown and the more the body is revealed, it actually, in terms of, a, of Greek artwork, equates more with kind of celebration of that body type. So weirdly, men being nude in our culture feels kind of like disrespectful. In, in statuary from ancient Greece, the nude male is really more celebration of perfection. So weirdly, the more naked the figure becomes, the more they're celebrated. It feels odd to even say that because it's so the opposite of how we view things in our um, depictions. I mean, imagine the president nude would be very unusual and, uh, and unacceptable to us, right? Um, a nude model on the cover of a magazine or a bikini clad model on the cover of a magazine is not someone we necessarily would think of as having a, a high place in our society. So it's an odd, odd cultural aspect. The figures, whether male or female, do tend to seem more alive. More often than not, they take a step forward, but they have the archaic smile, that slight um, upturn of the corners of the mouth, not so much to imply that they're just overflowing with joy, but to give us a sense of life. The peplos, speaking of clothing, especially for female uh, figures, the peplos is the female garment you see depicted to the right, a very heavy woolen garment, and it does really kind of hang over the body and make it more like a vertical column, which in a weird way is a little bit more how the male figure is presented. The Kuros figure to know that's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York is our archaic period Kuros, and he is a great example of this early phase of Greek culture. It is kind of boxy, kind of squat. He has very broad, squared shoulders. He does seem pretty powerful musculature, and you can clearly see that the artist has done, although they don't look necessarily real, look at the detailing in the folds of the skin and muscles above the kneecap. You can see a lot of um, tension and rigidity there. When you think about these figures, think about ancient Egypt, and that's why I wanted you to see it from multiple points of view. The Egyptian statues, uh, this size, this is essentially a life-size, slightly larger than life-size figure, the Egyptian equivalent to these would never have all that negative space carved away in between the arms and the torso or in between the legs. The Egyptian sculptures also, if they were taking a step forward, that back leg would be in perfect vertical alignment with the spine. It would be flat against a back background. So the leg taking that step forward would actually be longer than the leg that would be rigid against the back. It is in this case obvious that as the figure steps forward, it brings the torso over negative space. You can see that right here. That negative space between his legs is the core of the body, as opposed to the torso being flat back against a background. This leg is an angle too, right? It's not flat straight up and down the way the Egyptian sculptures 
always were. So you can see that the figure is occupying our space. He's stepping into the real world, and it's only going to become more real going forward. So you can see the Kuros figures have a pretty um, standard appearance. They are not meant as portraits of individuals. They are absolutely meant to be kind of symbolic of human perfection. Most of them are associated with burial sites. The female figures, some of them are more likely to be found in temples as votive offerings. This likely would have been holding a votive. You can see sometimes they are missing the arm that would have uh, extended forward to hold an offering out to a goddess. You can see the clothing does kind of de-emphasize the hourglass shape of a female silhouette, but you can still see that the breasts especially do get some attention. We start to see the um, femininity in that three-dimensional uh, depiction. This particular core is one who holds a symbolic motive. She's holding a pomegranate, so perhaps she could be associated with Persephone, the um, goddess who's forced uh, in sort of against her own uh, best judgment into a marriage with Hades, and she's allowed to come back to the earth temporarily she comes back uh, and creates springtime. So she also is a cemetery figure, but perhaps associated with goddesses. It, it's, you notice as we move forward in time, the figures begin to have a little bit more naturalistic roundness. The muscles, especially in the torso, begin to be depicted in a more believable way. Look at this figure's forearm. It really starts to have contour of muscle that begin to look more fully human, and yet the faces kind of look mask-like, don't they? They look almost as if they are all the same person or they're all trying to be the same. This is a pretty remarkable piece that um, is associated with the Acropolis. He would have been only slightly shorter than average human height, and you notice he's carrying this calf over his shoulders. We'll see a figure very similar to this begin to emerge in Roman artwork carrying a sheep. It will be um, very closely related to some early depictions of Christ, which is kind of a remarkable thing. The Kuros figures, as we move forward in time, get more and more and more naturalistic. So even though the figure is still somewhat stiff and the weight seems to be very even across both feet, you start to have some curvature to the muscles, to the details. If you look away from the face, which still retains that kind of uh, mask-like quality, and start to look at the articulation in the body, the muscles above the kneecap begin to be much more believable in this figure. So we really start to see um, a movement toward making the figures feel as if they are more and more alive, more and more like the real world. The so-called Peblos Kore, who may actually have been, uh, in fact, a statue of a goddess, is uh, the one to know for the test for the, for the early female statues. We don't know for sure whether that garment fits the uh, parameters of the peplos or whether it's actually a cape over a uh, dress form known as, known as the chiton, but it's more than uh, certain that she held something in that missing arm. We also know that the figure was extraordinarily well painted. It is hard to see in um, in the light of day in the museum that she's located in. But if you uh, were able to see with um, a specialist equipment, you can see traces of pigmentation that probably depicted a series of animals in the band here down the front of the lower part of her garment. But these Kore figures sure do feel that they are related to the equivalent male figures. They have the archaic smile, they have the sense of the beginnings of, of uh, human life-like depiction. It is odd that some aspects of the body are hidden more with the female figure than the male. Again, it is about a culture that honors men over women.
We start to see more elaborate clothing in later versions of the Corey figures, and you can see that there is obvious tracing of uh, remains of paint in all of these. The closer we get to the true classical era, the more the statues begin to move in three dimensions and the more damage they seem to take. So you can see that the figures have arms moving forward away from the torso of the body. We also know that once the Egyptian or the Greek uh, sculptors perfect their techniques in casting bronze, we can see even more in those bronze original statues, the movement of the body away from the torso, the holding outward of arms, legs, away from the core um, torso is possible because the bronze itself will hold its own weight over empty space more easily than uh, a material like stone. Stone is very prone to breakage. And so sometimes you'll see these little, what are sometimes called bridges connecting parts of the body to try to stay them. But you can see how frequently those sculptures break. So when we start lining the figures up, you can really start to see a movement from more geometric, uh, abstract, symbolic form to a more believable, uh, natural pose. And that happens both with male figures and with female figures. So the more that they look natural, the more we start to think of them as looking like real people. But remember that even though they start to resemble human bodies, they're still what the Greeks would have considered perfect human bodies, and that that perfection has a system to it. It has a system of proportions that is somewhat more complex than the Egyptian canon of proportions that we saw, but nonetheless is very important in terms of maintaining this cultural standard. So some attention now to architecture, we definitely need to learn architectural terms. So these can be kind of complex. You may want to come back to this section again. Obviously, you can always look at the PowerPoints independent of the voiceover. So the classical orders are the terms that we give to describe three different major styles in architectural decoration. The earliest and most simple is known as the Doric style. The more slender, more elegant style we associate with the classical era of Greece is the Onic style, and the style that really has almost too much going on, too much movement, um, is the Corinthian style. So they progress in time just like the sculptures do and just like the vase painting does. To go from geometric style to black figure to red figure to white is increase in the amount of detail and the amount of emotion. The same thing happens to statues, the same thing's happening here with architecture. So different parts of the architectural uh, building types need to be recognizable to you. So the uh, best example I can give you for architecture will be temples, and those temples tend to be, if we're looking at a bird's eye view of a floor plan, they are rectangular. The entrances are on the short sides as opposed to the long sides. The Greek temples have colonnades, series of joined columns surrounding inner walls. So the actual rooms themselves are inside of these sort of hallways created by these columns around the outside. The inner rooms can be called either the cella or the nows. The columns are the easiest ways to tell the styles apart, both in their shape and in what we call the capitals, the decorative element at the top. So with the classical orders, the three major styles, if you look at the column and look at the capital, you can tell the or part. The top of the Doric column is a pretty simple geometric drum. The top of the Ionic column has the signature curls on the corners, and those curls are known as volutes. The most decorative capital is on the Corinthian column, and the Corinthian style is meant to look like elaborately abstracted acanthus leaves. So you can definitely see the elements of the columns, the base 
is of course the transition between the column and the floor that it sits on. The Doric order doesn't have a base, but the Ionic and Corinthian do. All three orders are fluted. The shaft is the vertical element, the capital is the top, and it's really the capital that gives away which style is which. The entablature is the area of sculpture above the columns, but below the triangular section found on the short ends of the columns. The temple essentially has a gable roof, so from the front there's a triangular shape. That triangle is called the pediment, and there's usually sculpture there. Right below the pediment, but above the column, is the area known as the entablature, and within that we also find sculpture. In the Doric order, those sculptural elements are divided into panels. There are decorative panels of columns, three columns each, for the triglyphs, and then the section between each triglyph is called a metope. In the Ionic and Corinthian style, instead of dividing things up, we have what we call a continuous frieze. The sculpture is not bound into small square or rectangular sections. So looking at some of the earliest examples of the architectural style of the temples, we can see here the Temple of Apollo. Early on, we have some examples of uh, architectural designs in which the columns themselves are, are carved into statues. And you can certainly see that here at the rate of the Siphonians. That is an idea that will come back to us again as we head into the full-on classical era. Definitely sculptural friezes are uh, recognizable areas for low on um, low relief uh, sculpture, and we'll see sculpture evolve in this form as we go forward. Temple of Apollo is one of the earliest examples of a Doric uh, style temple, and this is of course all that remains, that Doric drum at the top, but you also notice, I think, more easily from the photograph than from a diagram, that the columns themselves do have a swelling in them. They do get to their widest point at about a third of the way up from the ground. They taper near the top, and they kind of swell in the middle and taper again as they go to the bottom. We call this intasis, and it seems to suggest the ability of the columns to bear the weight. It makes them feel more monumental. You certainly can see that happening here with the Temple of Hera. There are three temples in Paestum that are um, two believed to be dedicated to Hera. There are uh, different variations on these early temple styles. The Doric is by far the squattiest, and you can see that here at the earliest example, the Temple of Hera one. You can even in this version of the Doric capital that it even looks kind of smushed, sort of like what we saw in the uh, capitals all the way back in the Minoan palaces. Notice though that those Minoan columns would have tapered from top to bottom, and this sits in the middle and tapers to both ends. It also feels like the proportions are a little different than you're accustomed to. The uh, original Doric proportions do make the entirety of the building feel somewhat squat and wide. You're going to see that that changes a bit as we move forward, but you'll see here from this shot that really this proportion of the uh, front of the temple to the length does still betray the kind of squatty wideness that is characteristic of the Doric style. Temple of Hera II doesn't have quite as squatty an appearance. You notice that the Doric columns are able in their capitals to have a little bit more uh, dimension at the top. They don't look as squashed. And because we've reduced the number of columns across the front, the proportions now feel more rectangular. Uh, and you also get a sense still of there being some intasis, some swelling in the columns themselves. You can clearly see here the triglyphs and metopes marching across the sculptural area in the entablature. And you notice that they line up centered over each column is a triglyph, and then centered in between each column is a triglyph, leaving a space for sculptural relief in the metopes in between.
So the pediments themselves very often do have sculptural forms, and those sculptures become more and more elaborate as we go forward. This is a very early one, Temple of Artemis at Corfu. That central figure in this one is Medusa, the terrifying gorgon who can turn you to stone. So you're definitely going to see some uh, use of the temple pediment sculpture to show battle scenes and challenges for heroes. But again, the earliest examples are going to look, to some extent, um, fairly simple in comparison to where we're going. You'll definitely recognize the Doric by its capitals, and of course you'll be able to tell it by the triglyphs and metopes. Artist recreation of the temple we're looking at right now, the idea of them being painted is often a little confusing for us. We're used to thinking of them as being these white marble halls, but in fact would have had really elaborate painting as well. This gives you a better idea of what those uh, painted pediment sculptures should have looked like. And then we get a sense of what we're left with. Isn't that kind of shocking? When you see an artist's recreation of what the Greeks had in mind when they built these, and then you look at the remains, it's really kind of shocking. Um, so many of the temple sculptures are in terrible disrepair, and so the, the consensus seems to be to show only what is original and to not add extraneous pieces to try to put them back together, but to place them into the composition in exactly the positions that they should have been in. It gives you a sense of what the temple pediments might have been. But it's shocking when you think about how much is missing from the experience, not only in terms of missing pieces, but in terms of the missing color as well. There's a lot of expression, even in the earliest examples. We do have the feeling of heroes um, and the mortality of human beings expressed 